Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Kiran, Geeta, Vijay, Meha, and to all others who have joined. Um, one small request to all of you is please to stay on mute so that we can avoid any background noises. Um, and yeah, uh, Mary, can you please? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, before we even start, I would like to start from my introduction. Um, so this is Sylvia um, and I've been in the industry for the last 10 years. So my overall experience is around 10 years. And for the last four years, I've been into training sector as well, wherein uh, my core expertise is into data warehousing, ETL, uh, big data, Hadoop and Spark technologies. Yeah, so my overall experience is around 10 years on in which uh, four years is into the training sector wherein I do take trainings on big data and its related technologies uh, and also into data science, Python, SQL and all these uh, uh, technologies as well. Now, uh, today and tomorrow, we will be talking a lot about big data and I will be showing you um, how in lab you can practice um, and the different eco components that can be merged along with big data and basically what is big data and breaking them down into multiple parts. All of them will see. So let me start sharing my screen. Um, I just want to start up with a um, few of the concepts and then we'll slowly get into the questions. Uh, now, I just want to set up the agenda first. Uh, let's have a one hour complete talk about uh, what, do you, what are you going to learn on understanding the evolution of the data, like how the data has been changed from the early days to now and what is basically big data as a term and why people are calling big data basically as a problem right like you would have heard this term a lot in a lot of places so big data is basically a problem it's an issue so why it has been considered and also how do how it comes as a solution to this big data and then we'll also see about the differences between some of the traditional and how distributed system and then for the 10 minutes of time that we'll do have some questionnaires um, now, I would like to keep it in this space so that we can try to cover a lot of areas. As you know, this is a quite big sector, so we have a lot of things to understand. But then having said that, you can uh, bring in your questions on the chat box. I'll also have a quick look on the chat box. Now, if any of the questions needs to be addressed immediately so that your uh, further learning can be of uh, easy, then I will definitely do that. But all other questions, let's park it for this 10 minutes, okay, so that we can have an uninterrupted learning. And again, for the next set of 40 minutes, we'll have the uh, second part of the lecture, wherein we do uh, see a lot of interesting stuff, uh, uh, wherein how this whole um, concept of Hadoop, which is going to be considered as a solution, is working. At a very high level, I have prepared um, um, a sketch which can basically give you idea on how all this uh, workings are basically happening. And then the different modes in which you can operate with your uh, Hadoop. Okay, and finally, and finally, um, various types of files uh, that can be had, uh, that can be used inside this, like, like what are the different types of files that we basically do have here, okay? And again, towards the end, we'll again have in one more set of questionnaires, wherein uh, we can discuss about what are all the topics that we have covered within the second part of the lecture, okay? Is that all set? You can definitely yes. convey to me on the chat box. Uh, I would recommend to keep chat box as a medium for our communication so that, as I said, uh, the learning will not be interrupted, but definitely if you have some questions and if you think that can be put into words better if you talk, very well do raise hand option. I'll, uh, I'll ask you to unmute and you can go ahead and ask your question, okay? So, okay, so let's start. Now, the first thing is understanding about uh, the evolution. So this is something which is quite simple, like all of us know it, like how a, a data has been evolved, especially people who have born in the years of 80s and 90s will have a very good understanding because we have seen in all these extremes, right? 
wherein initially the data was written in only in, in terms of paper uh, because you don't have much to convey or much to uh, share with people around us. But then later uh, when computer starts uh, coming in and we started storing the data in the format of disks, uh, we would be using them. In my college days, I have did all my project work in the floppy disks. And then comes your compact disks, right? The disks that we uh, used to watch movies to and also to keep uh, files inside it, all kind of documents inside it. And then slowly it gets evolved and data has been much more comparatively can be stored inside and very uh, compatible and, and easy to carry pen drive. And then from there it goes into nowadays, we are uploading anything and everything over the cloud, whether it could be your drives or it could be, I can hide some missions from, if in case I don't have mission, physical mission with me, I can very well go ahead and hire some missions from cloud service providers. And there you can upload all our materials and documents, right? So evolution of data is something that all of us are experiencing, uh, regardless of uh, which uh, year being born, we have definitely seen a very good uh, a transition been happening in the type of data that we are dealing with and also in the storage medium in which we are uh, dealing with right now before i take you into the next slide just want to ask a quick question to all of you so you would have heard about this term big data right somewhere or the other maybe from some of your colleagues or you yourself would have done a little bit of an r d on uh, what is this big data so how do you coin this term from your angle, like, okay, according to me, this is what big data is. Okay, you can put it over the chat box, just two, three words, which you think can describe big data from your point of view. I can't read all of your um, um, answers, as you can see, there are 50 people, 51 people right now. So, yeah, I, but I'm anyway seeing all of your answers. So please do put in your answers on the chat box. What do you think big data is from your perspective? <clears throat> okay, okay. While working on data science, huge data, large volume of data. Okay, any other answers apart from these words? like high, large, huge, vast. Okay, enormous. Unstructured variety, okay. Volume variety, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Terabytes, okay, great, right? See, if we, uh, if we have a look on all of your answers, I hope all of you are able to see each other's answers too. Uh, most of them come under an, uh, an umbrella term like large or huge, right? Just with different English words. It can be enormous, it can be huge, it can be voluminous, it can be high. But then at the end, all of them comes under a size, which is, it's basically, uh, uh, all of you are rating it purely based on the size. Uh, defined by four Vs, okay. Yeah, an interesting answer here. We can't solve it on SQL and MongoDB, right? Yes, definitely can take that. In this, we can deal with huge volumes, yes. So now how I will term it is, it's a large and a complex set of information, right? Now, in that complex word, I can uh, bring in all varieties of data also. And in large, I can describe about the size of them as well. But then how uh, very basically somebody can understand what is big data. Like, for example, imagine there is a person who don't have any technical expertise in understanding any of that. And how they can um understand big data or even you like you are just stepping into this uh, spectrum of it like into big data now how you will initially understand about what is big data simply like anything which cannot be stored on your single system okay and your system can be of any configuration don't just bother about it your system can be often uh, 1 tb hd or 5 tb hd or 15 tb hd doesn't matter now in your machine 
if it is not possible for you to store a data, then that is a big data to you. Now, the same thing need not be a big data to another person, right? Because he might be having a higher storage space, right? So how this can be defined then is it's a relative term. So something which can be considered as a big data to me need not be considered as a big data to you because you might be having a very good storage space compared to right? So that is why if you observe, there are no common threshold that can be set uh, in order to define, okay, if it crosses this threshold, it's going to be a big data. It purely depends upon every individual machine's configuration and where we are trying to store. And these kind of data can be of different types, can, uh, can come in different patterns and formats at different speed that we are going to talk about. But at a very higher level, anything that cannot be stored in your single machine, that is basically a big data. And obviously it's a problem, right? Because you're not able to store it, then you have to find a way to store it. Now, if you go little deeper into the problem, that is where you can understand the official definition uh, coined by uh, IBM as an organization. So now, what they are saying is uh, any data that basically satisfies or that falls under um, five different V's in the sense, V's in the sense I'm starting the words that starts with the letter V. I think somebody also has put that. Uh, somebody on the chat box has also put that saying it can be defined by four V's, right? Yes, the same thing. So what they are saying is uh, uh, as an IBM, like uh, as a company, what they have come forward and saying is like, this is a, a definition that you can call it uh, uh, if you want to address a particular data as a big data. So now what they are saying is, let me give you five different V's. If you feel any of these V's are satisfied by your data, then you can very well consider that as a big data. Now, first point, as you can see here, it's velocity. Now, all of us know what we, what we mean by velocity, nothing but the speed, right? The rate at which the data comes to me. Now, today the, rate, uh, the data can come to me at a particular speed. Uh, that doesn't mean it is going to stay forever, right? Now, People who are coming from a retail background uh, can understand it even better because in few periods uh, of sales, you will not be experiencing a lot of POS data, but then on an, another part of the year, uh, especially during, uh, this, uh, during the period where more number of sales have happened, during the time, the data that you need to process will be huge. And, but I'm not going to change any of my infrastructure for that, right? So I have to be very clear Depending upon how much of a speed my data comes, I need to handle it. So such kind of data which comes in a variety of speed can be considered as a big data. And the second V is basically variety. Many of you have put this variety, which basically says the data can be classified into three types, right? Hope all of you know this, right? What are the three types? Any idea? Unstructured and semi structured. Semi structured. Exactly. Right. Now, most of you know about that there are three different types of big data because they're out everywhere. Now, the challenge is what kind of data can be called a structure, unstructured, and semi structured. Structured data is quite simple. Like, as the name itself says, it has a structure running on it. So, uh, like all of your tables, right? like all of your RDBMS tables, uh, if in case you have a CSV files, which has a structure running on it, or even at times I have a DAT or a TXT files, which also have a structure running on it, can very well be addressed as a structure file, right? So TXTs, even TXTs, not necessarily only table should be considered as a structure, even sometimes text files, if in case it comes with a pattern running on it. And all of its CSV files, your TSV files, right? Uh, and even as I said, DAT at times, okay, JSON files, correct? Now all these files can be considered as your structure. Unstructured to be at a very high level, I generally say it all kind of your multimedia files, right? Starting from a simple picture file or a simple chat text message, 
um, and then all the way up to GIF files, MP3s, MP4s, all of them can be considered as an unstructured. Semi-structured file, lot of your XML files, CSS files. Now these files can very well be considered as a semi-structure. For people who have some idea on building XML files, you will be knowing about uh, this term called tags, right? Wherein we do have a lot of tags coming in and you will open a tag, close a tag, and we'll have the property enclosed inside that particular tag. So such kind of XML or related to XML files can be considered as a semi-structure. We will also be doing uh, uh, one of the way on loading a semi-structured file into our Hadoop uh, lab in tomorrow's session. Uh, so by that time, you can even understand uh, if in case you don't have an idea on how an XML look like, you will have an idea on that. Fine. So this is my second view. The third view is going to be volume, which is basically nothing but the size, right? And we have discussed about this before itself. Uh, wherein my size is not getting fitted inside my single system, then definitely it's going to be a big data, a very clear V that can be defined. And the fourth V, this fourth V has been added um, after these three Vs are added because initially when they come up with the definition, they uh, enclose the whole definition with the first three Vs only, but then later on, when uh, they start working in different scenarios and different data, the fourth V also pitches, which is basically called verosity. Now, this verosity is still being considered uh, a point for debate, uh, but uh, whether to include it in the actual definition of big data or not, but then let's understand about uh, uh, what is this verosity. Verosity simply means any data that can come with a lot of inconsistencies and unavoided information. In, I mean, things that, that are not needed for you. Um, uh, people who are working in projects on different technologies, you might be knowing, right? When you receive a data from client, it is not always in its purest form, right? We will do a lot of cleansing on top of it so that I can convert the data into a processable format. So such kind of data, when I'm reading a huge data from any one of the web servers, and I find a and find lot of inconsistencies and unwanted informations or symbols on it, then those kind of data can also be very well considered as a big data. So don't think uh, a data has to be really in its cleanable and observable format if it needs to be defined as something. It can also have a lot of inconsistencies because we uh, who are going to provide a solution for this big data will also have a step for cleansing. Okay, so in short, any data that has some inconsistencies or some unwanted information, when I say unwanted information, these information are not going to uh, give me any insights for my business. Even if a data contains all this, you can still consider that as a big data. And the final V is quite simple, which is basically value. Now imagine your, your clients are giving you some 15 T of information, okay, 15 terabytes of information, and they're asking you to store it. And they are into some telecom business. Okay, and they're asking you to do some insights out of the data. Now, when you are exploring the data, you are finding that these 15 T of uh, information are not much relevant to the insights that they are looking for. Then that is basically considered as a value because at the end, I'm not storing somewhere in terms of KBs or MBs. All I'm dealing is in terms of TBs and PBs. So I need to find a lot of ways to store this data successfully. And even after doing all this, if it not gives me any meaningful insights, there's no point in storing it, right? So when you define something as a big data, just make sure that it gives valuable business insights for, for you in the sense, for your clients who are looking for you to store this, to store and process. Perfect, okay? Now, okay, understood. So we have some idea now about what is big data and uh, which kind of data basically I can call it as a big data and all this. Now, I know it's a problem because I'm not able to store it. 
Now I need to find a solution for the same rate because obviously I understood that it's a problem. Now the next thing is I need to certainly find a solution for the same. Uh, now, such kind of solution which comes to uh, solve the problem of big data is basically your distributed file system approach. You would have heard this term a lot. Uh, need not that you have to work in big data environment to understand this term, uh, because this has been there even big data uh, before even big data comes into picture. So now what do you mean by a distributed file system? Simple, see what is my problem? My problem is my single system is not storing my data. Then don't worry, just split the data into multiple portions, store them in different machines, and then create a connection between all of them so that you can successfully, if you wanna store, very well I can store it. Same way if I wanna process it also, I can process. So that is what your distributed file system approach is saying. So the very high level, a distributed file system, as if you divide the words itself, you can understand you're going to distribute the data, which is in a file system format to multiple machines. Now, if you see my picture over here, you could see there are four machines. Okay, right now, just understand them as machines. Technically, you can also call them as nodes. Okay, I have four different nodes. Now I'm just naming them as P, Q, R, and S. It can be of any name, by the way, okay? And I have an another node called master. Now, what is this setup all about? Now, this is nothing but different slave systems, which I have hired, and I'm establishing some connection between them. And I also have a master node, and the master is also connected with all of these slave machines. Now, why this setup is in place? Because I cannot have uh, a single machine which can handle a huge uh, load capacity of a file. For that reason, all I'm planning to do is take a file, split them into multiple portions. I'm just calling them uh, randomly as A, B, C, D. And then I'm storing them inside all the slay machines. Establish connection between all these machines. Okay. And I will also call a particular machine as a master node, and that will be connected with all of these slave systems so that it can pass on commands and it can also get the acknowledgement back from all the slave systems. Now, the moment we see this, there are a lot of questions that can pop in. So I'll just list them out one after the other. Okay, now how the master will split, who will, uh, take the job of splitting it, right? Very common questions. Now, this is my file. Now, do I as a developer has to take the responsibility of splitting it? And will I be storing them in PQRS or how the storage happens? Simple. Now, I have a file, right? Now, I know the file is really bigger. And just imagine the file is now F. Nobody has split it right now. Now, how I can give it to this distributed file system? you will only give it to the master. You don't have any connection or establishment with all this slave nodes in place. Now, as a client, you will be giving your file to the master and the file is not splitted right now. The file is just in its fullable form and it's been given to the master. Now, what the master will do, it will only do the job of splitting them into different splits. I will technically call it as blocks, but then it is nothing but splits. Now one single file has been splitted or divided into different blocks. Who will do that? The master node will do that. Now how, we, how it is being done, will it follow any logic? All those we are going to study in a while. Right now just understand that it is going to uh, be divided into different blocks. And the master will send all the blocks to the different slave. Okay, first question got clear. Who will do the split and to whom I have to communicate if I want to keep something inside this distributed approach? The next question that obviously comes, uh, comes on our mind is, okay, how the master is actually placing all these blocks, right? Uh, why it has to go in this order? Can it be stored in this order? Why not in this order? Or why not in this order, right? 
or why not everything in one single machine? I mean, is there any possibility that it can be done if in case a machine can handle it? Yes, there are wide varieties of options possible, but then who will take care of all this is master. And then how it will take care of all this is, now the master system will have a complete picture of what is the overall configuration of every individual slave node. Now, for example, um, let's take the node P. Now, the node P is of having a configuration, let's say one TV and some 12 gigs RAM. Okay. And it has a, a particular portion of your one TV has been completely utilized. Now, master will first check will the machine P be capable to have this A inside it? In the sense, will it be having enough memory to keep A inside it? Will it be having enough memory to keep two blocks inside it? But then it doesn't make sense if I keep overloading the machine P because I have QRS also along with it, right? Because if I put all the loads inside my one single machine, then it's not going to be considered as a distributed approach, right? It's become a sequential process. And hence, what the master will do, it will have the complete configuration of every individual slave nodes. And based on their configuration, it will try to keep all the different blocks inside the different slave nodes. Okay, second question done. Third most commonly, uh, uh, the commonly asked question is, what happens if one of these guys is down, right? At the end, they are slave machines. At the end, it's a machine. So there is a possibility that it can go down. Very well, there is a possibility that it can go down. And what are the consequences that we will face? Right? If a machine is down, this particular block is not accessible by me anymore. Correct? Okay? And without this block, can this file can be completely stored? No. Or completely retrieved? Again. Now, this is one of the scenario that can happen a lot in a distributed file approach, but we do have solutions for the same. So the solution is a little bit longer. So um, I just want all of you to wait for a while. Uh, when we come to the second part of today's lecture, we'll see on uh, how this uh, failure can be handled. So it comes under, it gets coined under a term called fault tolerance. So we'll see how those uh, failures will be handled. Okay, got it? Any questions on the chat box? Okay. Any other questions apart from whatever questions that I have discussed, you can put it over on the chat. Okay. <clears throat> Fine, let's move on. Now, okay. Now we have an idea about the distributed file system. Now, what are the different distributed file system that can come forward and help me? Because at a very high level, I have explained you about distributed file system. So do we have any specific uh, uh, distributed file system that are available in the market, which can come and help us in handling this uh, huge volume of data? So that is where we have Hadoop in picture. Now, Hadoop is given by Apache as an organization, Apache Software Foundation. Um, now, they have given it as a complete open source in the sense like people can go ahead and download it and very well you can start practicing. Now, when it is uh, uh, used, see, if my big data, the huge volume of data that I'm going to handle it, if it is most of the data is going to be structured. For example, imagine you're working for a client who is giving you data uh, in terms of, uh, let's, let's not go to TVs, let's discuss in terms of GBs now. Now he is giving you some 50 gigs of data. Now you find the data not to be too big. Uh, you feel like your RDBMS itself can handle it, right? Now I can have a distributed approach in your RDBMS itself. Let's imagine you have an Oracle. Uh, you feel like, yeah, my Oracle can handle it. Why I need to unnecessarily go for a distributed file system like Hadoop? Now I can handle it in my RDBMS itself. Well, good, no problem. But then if the size increases, slowly it increases. Again, to an extent, I can upload them in cloud, right? Uh, you can handle the storage. 
but then where exactly you will find problem is when you start running complex queries right like when i start writing uh, some uh, lot of inner queries sub queries now that is where problem comes the latency will become really high uh, i need to find um, some or the other solution to speed up my process so that is where your rdbms stops so and that is where you have to id look out for a distributed approach which can work on its best in storing even if it is a structured data it can work on its best in storing as well as in process right so that's why they commonly uh, uh, say this like hadoop starts when rdbms stops in the sense when no more rdbms can help you that is where you have to think about uh, having hadoop as a solution for that fine as i said it's an open source framework comprising of multiple commodity machines so this is an another benefit uh, like apart from being an open source now what does it also say so imagine you have some four nodes okay and all these nodes are interconnected even these machines are interconnected now what they are saying is you don't have to uh, have a very higher end configuration machines in order to build this uh, connection or in order to build this cluster you can very well have very basic commodity machines now what do you mean by that now uh, like the machines that we use for our regular purpose or our personal purpose forget about the office based laptops like the ones that we use for our personal purpose right even with that we can practice hard what they are saying is when you are interested in building a cluster like this now have four or five machines download and have hadoop inside all of these machines establish connection between them and you are good to go ahead uh, with working on your hadoop cluster now as a framework or as in uh, as a overall process it gets divided into two major areas one area is responsible for its storage and the another area is responsible for processing the data that we have stored so the storage layer is basically called as hdfs layer or also known as hadoop distributed file system so now when i go to apache software foundation website and if i download hadoop and if i am installing it on all of these machines it basically creates two layers this is after you install hadoop on this machine okay now what is this bottom most layer referred to this is nothing but your storage so or in short i call it as hdfs and the top layer which is sitting on top of your storage layer which is basically your processing layer is called mr or mapreduce now this has to be done in all the machines on your master too on all your slave machines as well and then we are good to start with our process as well as our storage now your storage layer basically follows an approach called block processing so that is what uh, we are going to see in the next uh, uh, slide so now how the block processing basically happens and how a file will basically be divided into blocks what is the rule behind it and all this so the storage layer is basically storing your file in terms of blocks and the mr layer will basically consume these different blocks and apply whatever processing we want to do on top of those blocks so basically both the storage and the processing happens in terms of blocks here okay got it any questions in this place before we get into the difference perfect now let's try to understand uh, the difference between a hadoop distributed approach and the traditional ones that were existing before hadoop comes in picture because this has been there for uh, uh, close to two decades now right now i won't say completely to two 
one to one and a half decades. So be even before that, we do have the distributed file system approach in place. Like when you go to uh, uh, book some uh, railway tickets in counter, right? And similarly, when you go ahead and do some uh, transactions, uh, when you step into banks and you do face-to-face -face transactions. Now, the data locality is one of the way in which you can basically understand the difference between all those traditionally used distributed approach and the new one, which is HUD. So I will first give you the explanation on how these two works. And then um, after I finish the explanation, you can observe the difference in, uh, uh, in the way it, it happens. So let's first understand about the traditional one. As you see, there is a master node and there are three uh, slave nodes, okay? Now imagine there is a client, okay? And he is giving you a file. Uh, let's call this file is of size, let's say 100 gigs, okay? Now the master will read the file, okay? It understands a huge size file. So let's split it and store on the slave. So it's been stored like this. Now, right now, don't worry about how it splits because as I said, we'll cover that. Right now, just understand that it's been divided into 30, 30 and 40 gigs of data and it has been stored inside the three different slave nodes. And after this data has been stored, the slaves will also acknowledge back to the master saying, okay, the data has been stored and things are going good, okay? Now the same client comes up uh, with a program now and uh, he wants to apply this program on this 100 gigs of data. It can be a simple Java code or a Python or a Scala, any kind of program uh, it could be. Now the master will see the program first and it will understand, okay, now this program basically has to be applied on this file of 100 gigs. Then it will understand, okay, uh, where I have kept my portions, okay, it is there in S1, S2, S3. Then basically it will ask for all of your slave systems to send the data back to the master. And remember, these are traditional distributed systems. They are not commodity ones. So the master will be 10 folds, 10 X of the configuration of your slave machines. Okay, so it can very well handle a huge load. Now the master will get all this data and it will be processed inside the master machine. Now the program P will be applied to the 100 gigs of data, which comes back to the master. And I will be getting the output. This is how any processing and storage happens in a traditional distributed approach. The, the ways that we do follow in the earlier days before HADO. Now, when Hadoop pitches in, so it claims to give much efficient way of storage and process. So now we need to understand how and what is that. Now, what it says is, okay, I'm giving a file again. Okay, now again, let's let's uh, imagine it to be 100 gigs. And again, the same way here, 30, 30, 40. Perfect, storage is done. Now again, after being stored, the slaves are sending the acknowledgement also back to the master saying uh, it's been successfully stored, no issues. Now, the same client is again giving you a program. I'll call it as P as a program, okay? Again, could be of Java or Scala, or Python, whatever it is. Now, how in Hadoop it follows is the first point to be taken is it's not a higher end configuration machines because remember in Hadoop, all the machines are commodity machines. So first of all, a single master cannot handle that 100 gigs of load together. So what the master will actually do, it will take the program that has to be uh, executed and understand there are three machines in where I actually keep this file. So it sends another color. It basically sends the copies of all of this program to the slave machines. Now I have P as a program, right? Now what my master will do, it creates three copies of the program. Now why three copies? Because I have three slave systems. 
Now, all these programs are basically sent to all these slay machines, which are having portions of your data. And this will be applied on this slay machine, which is holding the 30 gigs of data. Remember, this is a slave node. So it has its own RAM, it has its own HD, make use of your uh, processing bar, apply the program on this 30 gigs, and it yields an output. Now, similarly, here also it generates an output, right? And similarly, here also it generates an another output. Fine. Now, individually, all the machines have generated the output, but this is not the end uh, of my program, right? Because I have three outputs now. I don't need three. I need one final output. Then in that case, how things will happen. Now, the master, after every individual slave machine has finished their output, it will command any one of the slave machine where it find it has enough processing power to basically consolidate all this intermediate output. Now, how this will be is, it's going to be something like this. Let's imagine, let's the, let the master pick this guy, which is my S3, okay? Uh, and now what this S3 is basically doing it is consolidating all of my outputs and generate the final output and keep it in whatever location the program is demanding. If your program is expecting the final output to be stored in so-and-so location, it will keep it over there and the clients will be intimidated about it so that the client can go uh, uh, and extract the output from whatever location they are looking for. Got it? So now what's the biggest difference here that you could see is the data is not the first very visible difference that you can feel is the data is not completely sent back to the master. I'm basically making use of parallelism here wherein I'm taking every individual machine's processing part separately and using the processing part, I'm making parallel processing uh, happening here and the outputs are being generated and one of the machine is finally uh, consolidating it for. So basically the program is only getting transferred here and the data is kept locally on all the slave machines. But here it is not that case. And that's why this term is coined, which is basically data locality in the sense keep the data locally on your slave machines and process them also locally on the slave machines because at the end, you have your slave node, which can very well do all this process. Okay. Is that clear? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, excuse me, yeah. I have a doubt. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Vikitesh. Yeah, in the previous slide. This so one? Suppose, yeah. While you were explaining, uh, mm -hmm. P1 is operating on S1 machine with the mm -hmm. localized data. So yeah. uh, if there is a data dependency or a program mm -hmm. is dependent on data, let's mm -hmm. say suppose the data is in S2 or S3, then mm -hmm. it can handle those situations. We'll see. see, now let's imagine I have, um, mm, let's say it's a CSV file which contains some thousand records inside. Okay, and it contains details about uh, the product, uh, I mean, the sales of different products month wise. Okay, now uh, let's take among this thousand, the first uh, 250 uh, uh, products is here. Okay, the next 250 products is here, the next 500 products is here. Okay. Now, the thing is, what you are saying is, now suppose this program P1 is applied on this 250 records on this machines. Now the same P1, the copy of P1 is only there on P2, right? Don't think it's a, the program has also been split. The program, the, as a whole program has been copied three times. So there won't be any dependencies over there, right? It's like the program is basically going to find uh, uh, the 
the average sales happen for every individual product. Now, first, what it will do within this 250 products, it will find an average sales. Now, within this 250, again, within this 500, it will find. Correct? Because it's the same program. It's not the program has been split. So the program, I can't say the program P1 is dependent on this 250. No, because P1 and P2 are same at the end of the day. And I cannot always say P2 is dependent on this 500 data because to handle this 500, I have P3 here. Yes, understood. Correct. Thank you. So the program is yes. not splitted here. The program is copied. So that's why we basically call it as an instance or a copy. Okay, understood. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Looks like it reduced numbers. And uh, one more doubt, sorry. Uh, so in data, in the traditional, the data is the only thing that's transferred, the program is not, right? Yes. Okay. Data is only getting transferred to the master and in the master, the program will be applied on the data. But then think of the data transfer. It, it is huge, correct? Yeah. 30 gigs yes. I'm transferring from here, 30 gigs I'm transferring and then 40. Forget about the processing, the transferring time itself will take a lot and the cost will be huge. Where in here, I'm only transferring the program. We know program will be somewhere in terms of KB. Definitely transfer yes. cost will not be much for us. Correct? So only the final response that has to be transferred back to master is the cost of data transfer. Exactly. Ma'am, is it same for the reference also? Like foreign keys in the database? Same for the foreign key. How come foreign key comes here? If I'm, I'm not getting it. Has foreign keys. How do pass foreign keys? Referencing. There is no referencing as such here, Likita. I'm not sure I mean, in what context you are talking. Referencing two databases. No, that is different, right? That is basically like we are trying to merge or trying to combine few data. Here, there is no combining happens. Here, we are individually processing. There is no need of any join here, right? Here, after you are reducing them finally into one single output, all these individual outputs that we have been calculated on the different slave machines, finally, we are combining them into one single output that need not necessarily need to be a join. It can be a join at times, but not necessarily only. So we can't conclude that it is same as a reference key concept uh, on your rescue. Okay. And then, uh, yes, you are exactly right. Uh, I just read your uh, thoughts. Yes. Fine, now let's move forward and understand one more difference, which also basically helps you understand uh, why Hadoop is a good choice. Um, now, the second difference is basically called as rack awareness, but before we even step into this, I want you guys to understand one very important term, which is called replication factor. Now, regardless of whether we are practicing in a distributed approach or we are practicing in a Hadoop-based approach, <clears throat> we have to know about this replication factor. So what is uh, this name or what is this term refers to? So replication factor is basically creating copies of the data um, that I'm uh, keeping it inside my cluster. Now, um, in the previous slide, I think two slides back, if you have observed, I told you, uh, that one or two machines can go down basically. And during that time, uh, we need to think about a quick solution of how we can handle it. Now that is where this replication factor principle comes in the sense. Now, if I have a file, okay. And if I'm going to store the file inside my cluster, it's not like I'll store only one copy. Rather, I will basically create two, three copies of the same file and I will keep them in different slave machines. Why? because at the end there is a possibility because especially it's a commodity hardware machine right i don't have an expectation of a higher end configuration so very well one or the other machine can go down now in those situations i have to make sure that the data is somewhere available always so that is where we are going to create multiple copies of the same file that i'm going to keep inside my cluster so now in general for Hadoop, the default replication factor number is three. So now any data that I bring in, I will basically 
create three copies of the data. I understood. People will immediately ask, won't it be taking so much of space? Agreed, very well agreed uh, to a point like, yes, if suppose I have 100 gigs of data coming in, ideally it's not 100 gigs consumption, it is 300 gigs consumption, right? Agreed, very much agreed. But then when you compare that with the availability of data at any day, availability has an upper hand. And for that reason, we are trying to uh, keep as many copies as possible, but then the, uh, the default number is three. Uh, so when you download Hadoop and have it in a cluster, it's going to be three, but uh, that's not going to be a fixed set number. You can very well configure it depending upon um, uh, what is your requirement, what is the size of your cluster and all this defines this number. Fine, now, before we uh, proceed. Uh, I had one doubt, this is regarding then processing. So uh, let, let me finish this rank awareness now so yes, that okay. we'll be done with this and then we'll take the question. Yes. Okay, okay. So okay. Now, now this number of replication factor is basically going to help us in uh, extracting the data in some unforeseen situations wherein your machine is not available. Now let's see how this um, uh, concept of rack awareness works in a traditional approach. So now imagine this is a rack one, okay, and this is rack two. And inside this rack, we do have multiple different systems and all these systems are interconnected and I have a master system too. Now I'm getting a file. Um, let's imagine the file right now has been split into two portions, let's say A and B. And I'm calling the replication factor as two. Just for an example sake, I'm calling it as two here. So now how the distributed approach will basically store it now, first point is whenever a file comes, it will identify if there is enough space here. Okay, let's go ahead and dump it. Remember two slides back also, we have seen this. Wherever there is enough memory, your master machine will basically keep those blocks inside that. Let's imagine it is storing in this format. Now, if you wonder on why two A's and two B's, because the replication factor is basically two. Fine. It has been stored in this way. Now, for some reason, one of my rack is not accessible right now. There could be a lot of factors, can be in a, a geographical location, which, which is not being accessed now, or it can be uh, corrupted, or it is for power failure, for some other reason, one of the rack is completely being inaccessible. Then in those situations, even though I maintain two copies, I cannot completely retrieve the whole of my file because I haven't planned it properly uh, when I was interested in storing them. Now let's talk about here, okay, how uh, Hadoop handles it, okay? Let's take the same file F, when it gets divided into A and B. Again, the replication factor, I'm, I would like to call it as two. Now here, how it happens is, it will not, uh, I mean, of course, I know space has to be one of the constraints, but space alone is not a constraint. Now, what Hadoop is also letting you uh, do is, <coughs> sorry, it makes sure or it uh, guarantee that one copy of the block should always be in another rack. Okay. Now, what this rule, it's, it's basically called as a thumb rule. It can be in either an another rack or an another system. If you follow a rack topology, it's going to be an another. If you, if you have a very small cluster wherein I don't have uh, racks, rather I do have only individual machines, then it's fine. It's going to be a machine. Now, how it has been applied, if I keep a copy of A and the replication factor is two, then 100% the other A has to be there on this rack not in the same rack, the same way here also. It has to be somewhere here. Now suppose, imagine my replication factor is three. Now, can I do in this way? Wherein keeping two A's here, one A. Keeping two B's here, one B. Very well possible because still you're following your rule. What is my rule? make sure that minimum one copy of my block 
has to be there in an another. So now if this, this machine has a capacity to store two blocks in it, very well you can go ahead and store it. And all you need to do is one another copy of that same block has to be in an another rack. So in an emergency situations wherein this complete track is lost, I can still retrieve the whole of my file from the second. Because Hadoop is a uh, commodity hardware cluster, there are there is a high risk and possibility of failure nodes can happen. And hence, this is a thumb rule which has to be followed strictly by the master when it is trying to push the data inside the slave So this rack awareness concept also helps uh, um, in situations uh, wherein we move to or it provides an edge towards your Hadoop distributed approach. Okay. It would be really great if you can um, um, uh, raise your hands, guys, because as you see, there are a very good number of audience. Um, uh, so I would request all of you to please raise hand if you have a question, especially when I'm in between the talk. Uh, yeah. Yes, somebody asked a question. I don't know who was that. You can unmute now and ask. Yeah, it was me. I was asking about processing. So. Mm -hmm. If we have the data in different systems and mm -hmm. at some point you need to pick it up again so the other system now will start processing only at that point or does mm -hmm. it pre-process as well? So does that affect the processing also in the st storage while we are storing it? See, when it is about just the storage, it's not a matter of concern at all. Correct? Individually, every block is going to be stored in different machines. When it comes to processing, the block, whatever that particular mission is responsible for, that is only going to be processed. Okay, it's not dependent on the earlier processing of the records because again, remember the same program is being shared to all the slave machines. Nowhere there is going to be a dependency of the previous, see, as I said, 250, 250, the second set of 250 records, if you want to aggregate, do you have a prerequisite of the first 250 to be done? It's not that I agree. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking mm -hmm. as in when you therefore decide that the second block then should start processing uh, that this data simply because it could be working in parallel or we might be wasting resources and stuff as well as uh, storage. Something like no, that is what I'm saying. Uh, no, it should be definitely parallel because then only at the end of the day I can solve such a huge load and I can finish such a huge processing. Certainly it has to be parallel. So don't we then end up hitting three times the uh, uh, resources also, like just not storage, but also CPU mm -hmm. and memory and also mm -hmm. is becoming three times. No, the... okay, got it. So you mean to say like you are processing all the three copies? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. No, 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 not all the three copies. No, no, not all the three copies. Yeah, so when do you decide that, okay, the primary is not responding, so the secondary starts picking up, how do we do that pass, uh -huh. pass, uh, okay. passing? That's what I was asking. Got it, got it. So that part we will discuss deeply in our workflow. So wait, let me quickly show you since you've pulled in. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, we'll cover later. Then. Right. Yeah, this is a place where you will understand it. But then to clear your question right now, the processing will not happen on all the three copies. It is just a backup, right? Only on one copy of processing will happen. The remaining two will be there in some unforeseen situations wherein the first one is not available then i might be in need of second or third but then okay. only browsing will happen on only one copy okay okay got it am i clear yes you are yeah yes guys any other questions i'm not seeing any questions so far on the chat okay Assume that things are clear so far. Um, okay, we'll do one thing quickly. Let me see where I have to. Uh, okay, let me take five more minutes and then we'll uh, go ahead. Yeah, now the next thing that we need to understand is basically block size. Now, because Mm, so far, I'm telling you a lot about a file that has been divided into blocks A, B, or A, B, C, or A, B, C, D, so on, right? Now, you might be wondering on who decides this, like, um, 
um, have a file, why not it can be divided into five? Why it has to be divided into two? Simple. The very basic logic behind deciding how many blocks a file should basically have is defined by uh, a term called block size. And it comes in your installation itself when you download and install Hadoop on your machine. It comes with the default block size. Now, what do you mean by this uh, uh, block sizes? Now, when a file comes with so-and-so, let's say when a file comes with a size, say X, then it will be divided by your default block size so that I will understand how many number of blocks has to be generated. So, right. <clears throat> now what is it block? What is it block size? Now in version one of Hadoop, it was 64 and in version two and three, it became 128. Now, again, this is a default number, need not necessarily you have to go by that because definitely when you're working on a huge cluster wherein I'm dealing in with files in terms of GBs, splitting them into MBs doesn't make much sense because I will end up in having huge number of blocks. Now, uh, how then it can be done? It can very well be configured. So now if I have a very huge cluster, let's say thousand node cluster and the size of data that I'm dealing in on day in day out is in somewhere in uh, a higher end of gigs, then you can better have a bigger block size too. So you don't have to stick with this default number. But then uh, in case of a default number, if you're going by a default number and if you're working on a version two of Hadoop, then file size divided by 128 MB will basically give me the total number of blocks that we have. Now, suppose I have a 256 MB sized file, then simple, it will basically generate two blocks. Now, who will do this? No, you as a developer, you don't have to do this job. You just give the file to the master machine of your cluster, which is the entry point to your entry point or face of your cluster overall. And that master machine will basically uh, gets the file, applies the simple math, and then it will understand, okay, these many number of blocks I have to basically generate. Now, if I increase a block size, definitely the number of blocks is going to be reduced for me. And at any day, keeping a minimal number of blocks is really helpful for me because I don't have to do a lot of discrete steps, right? Now, understanding that, one more thing you need to know here, which is basically called dynamic storage. Now, what do we mean by uh, this dynamic storage? Let's, let's imagine a situation wherein, um, okay, let me take a very simple number. I'm calling a file of size 258 MB and I'm trying to identify how many number of blocks it will basically generate. I got three. But then not three as a whole, right? So three blocks. The first block, uh, of course, I'll consume the entire one, right? Which is your entire 128 MB I will take. Got it. The second 128 MB, of course, again, entirely I will take. But in the third block, I, I'm not in need of the entire 20, um, entire 128. Rather, I only need 2 MB because I'm in need of 2 MB files only, uh, 2 MB size only from this overall 128. Now, the biggest question is what will happen to the remaining 128? 26 MB because you have given a block and a block is 128 in its size but in that I'm only taking 2 MB for my consumption so the remaining 126 what will actually happen so now in all other traditional approaches right how things will happen is um, these left out memory right in any block if there are any left out memories being there then those left out memory will be sitting idle there, idle there and it will not be used for any further storage. So it is basically a waste of memory. Of course, uh, the collection concept, the 
concept like garbage collection pitches in or disk defragmentation pitches in and collects it, but not at that point of time it's going to be used. After a period, it can be taken from that particular location and it can be used for further processing. But then in that point of time, till the duration of whatever process you're running to collect all this space, it is going to be sitting there idle. But when it comes to Hadoop, how it is managing this is, it is going to collect all these memory, which is basically called as a left out memory, and it, go, and it is going to keep them in a pool space in every slave node. Okay, remember this is happening in, a, in one single node. The same can be understandable in different slave nodes too. So now every individual slave node will have a pool space wherein all these left out memory from every individual block will be stored. And then when the pool space reaches a threshold, which is purely decided by your architects, your, uh, your big data architect, who is deciding I and mean, how it has basically been decided what is the average size of data that you bring in every day and how it has been uh, processed and all those and uh, what is your block size in your cluster. Based on all these calculations, they will come up with a number. Now, when your pool space reaches that threshold, then it will be taken out and it will be sent to the uh, sent for further usage of that memory. So basically the concept is none of the memory goes into waste and that's why it's called dynamic storage. How much ever you need, take that. The remaining memory is not going to be wasted. It's going to be reused for upcoming files. Okay, by this, I can make sure uh, that I'm not wasting any of the memory because uh, imagine we are working on a big data kind of environment where you can't always expect all of your files to be multiples of your block size, right? Definitely it can be somewhere up or down. And hence uh, wasting memory uh, uh, for the uh, sake of blocks is not a uh, good choice. And that's where this concept of dynamic storage, which is. Block size cannot be reconfigured in the middle, uh, Shubramanya. Okay. Now, when you initially set your cluster, that is where you have to basically set your block size. Now, if suppose you feel like, okay, now I'm in interested in changing the blocks because in, when you initially build your cluster, you have a mindset that you will be reading data only in the average size of, let's say, 50 gigs. But then after a few months, you have more of clients coming in and you have an, uh, a requirement of processing huge number of files, then the existing block size is not going to support you, right? You feel like it would be better if I can change it to a higher number or maybe upgrade it from version. That is anyways not happening nowadays because uh, it would have happened a long time back because right now all of us are using version two and three. But then even in the other situation, the situation that I have explained, right, wherein uh, I'm uh, right now getting into a scenario wherein I'm handling too much, uh, too much amount of data, then very well you can change it, but then it undergoes a lot of steps. Now, uh, changing for the earlier block size, yes, of course, there are some algorithms wherein it can take it, but then you can skip that part also. What you can do is you can generate them as different versions inside your cluster, starting from the place where you reconfigured. From that time onward, all your files will apply into this blocks and the earlier file will go into the previous blocks. But then again, there are a lot of algorithms. It's a complex process. But to answer your question, it can very well be reconfigured, but the cluster needs to go through a lot further. Okay, and hence, mostly the architects will decide uh, a higher end in terms of block size when they initially build up a cluster. So you will never undermine the size because right now, today I'm working in with uh, uh, 50 gigs of files, need not necessarily be the same case after six months, right? So when your architects decide it, we'll do a lot of math and a lot of brainstorm to understand, okay, how much data um, averagely every month, how much I'm going to be increased, like 5% of today's size or 20% of today's size data. Based on that, you will come up uh, with an average number on your process. Is that clear? 
<coughs> yeah, Arya, you have a question? No, actually, it got answered in the previous part when you explained. Okay. Okay, no. My question was going to be, is it possible for the master to decide that based on the size of the file and the number of nodes it has uh -huh. or the uh, clients, clients it has, can't it dynamically decide this should be the block size for that one style? Okay. Okay. Now, is that clear for you? Yeah, to an extent, yes. So. Okay. Now, let's get into the installation part. So, uh, if you are going for taking into the installation, um, um, in learn bay on all the classes that I do take, uh, I do give you a VM, which has all of the Hadoop related eco components being pre-built inside it. I do give it as a VM, which is basically based on Ubuntu operating system. Now, apart from that, if you feel like, okay, can I go ahead and um, um, do the installation directly from Apache's website. So can I go ahead and download it and can have it installed in my machine? Very well, you can go ahead and do it. So I have to go to the website, say, org.apache.hadoop. If time permits, I'll show you about a few of uh, this website towards the end of uh, today's session. Uh, so this is your official website from where you can go ahead and download. Arya, can you please Arya? mute yourself? Sorry. Yeah, thanks. No. Uh, so this is their official website. So uh, you can go to their website and from there you can download the tarball, which is a zipped tarball. You have to unzip it and you can have it on your system. But then um, uh, the reason why I generally do provide an VM uh, instead of asking you to directly go ahead and download is when you go to the website and download, it just comes only with Hadoop two components, which is HDFS and MapReduce, just with its storage and processing. But then when you are learning it as a whole course, you are learning it as a data engineer, wherein you have to start all the way from extraction. So now how I can extract different data from different streams and then bring it into the storage layer and then from there how the processing happens. So just these two components will not be enough. So we need to separately again download an, another component called scoop. Now, Okay, let me write it because these names could be new to you. I don't know. So we need an another component called scoop. Okay. Now scoop is a component which is basically going to extract um, all your um, RDBM data. Now, suppose I have an RDBM content in me. It's working good, but the challenge is when I start writing some complex queries and joins, it's not working as expected. So in that case, you have to bring them into your Hadoop environment and process. For that, you have to use this component called Scoop. Now this, if you are interested in downloading it, you have to again go to uh, Apache website. It's, an, it's from the Apache Foundation. So you can go ahead and search for Scoop download there. You have to separately download it and connect it the bash file on the default Hadoop configuration. Similarly, we need an another component called Flume. So now this is to extract streaming data in the sense real-time data, right? If a data comes to me at a speed, let's say 10 Mbps or 20 Mbps, then how I'm going to extract them, bringing into my storage layer and processing. So for that, we have an, we are in need of an another component called Flume. And along with that, we need height. Now, Hive is an uh, alternate for Java when it comes to applying your MapReduce. So MapReduce is basically been given in Java, uh, but then if there are any non-Java programmers, or if you feel like I'm not great on Java, so is there any other alternative ways in programming? That is where Hive pitches in. So now Hive is basically working on a language called HQL, which is kind of very similar to your SQL. So now if you have good expertise on SQL, then you can convert that knowledge into HQL and using that you can write MapReduce program. Now these components will not come on your direct uh, Hadoop download. You have to separately go and download Scoop, Flume, Hive, 
and then integrate all of them together. And it need a little bit of expertise on your Unix programming. So for that sake, I generally do give a VM uh, which has all of these components downloaded and installed and configured. And that VM I do provide so that when you download that VM and you can start practicing on all these components. Now it comes up with few other components too, but since we are not going to discuss them on the webinar today, I'm not uh, writing, listing them out. We do have SPAR, we do have Python, R, and all other uh, good number of components inside that VMS. Fine. Now, how the installation basically happens. So few things you have to understand here, because every time when we uh, see or study something with respect to Hadoop, uh, uh, we understand them in terms of clusters, right? Multiple machines. Either they be connected uh, through whatever protocol it is, all the machines has to be of connected. Now, um, the challenge is not everybody can go and have uh, physical machines, install Hadoop on it and build a connection in there. So now that is where Apache uh, uh, itself, they have come up with an another way of installing Hadoop, which is basically called pseudo distributed system. Now, what is a pseudo distributed system of practicing Hadoop is? You need only one single system, but then within a single system, we are going to build a logical illusion of different systems or different programs running in it, wherein one thread of program will act as a one slave, another will act as an other, and one thread will act, act as a master. But at the end, all of them are running as services under a single system. So now it's going to be and there and at the end it is a it is based out of Java. So we need a JVM uh, by the way. So now this is my uh, single mission. Now within that, I will run multiple instances of JVM. Now one of the instance will basically act as an <coughs> name no, and the another instance will basically act as an slave node one, slave node two, and so on. And we, and we virtually connect all of them. And all of them are going to be running as different services within your single system. And they will be connected to each other. And that is how you can experience and understand how the same kind of things can be scaled up and be deployed in a fully distributed system. So what is a fully distributed system? Wherein I have physical machines, different physical machines uh, it can be either in an on-premise or it can be on cloud. That's not the uh, uh, point of concern, but at the end, they are going to be different machines. Either you can have a physical machine, have an infrastructure, establish connections between them, have it on-premise, or I don't have all the facilities. Why can't I hire it from uh, service providers like AWS? Very well, you can do that. Go and hire a few machines from AWS, establish connections between them, Nowadays, when you're downloading, you can specify what are all the things that you need as well, right? Earlier, you don't have that facility. You have to hire machines. Uh, and, I may, and I know I have manually go and download Hadoop and all of them, but now you have EC2 uh, wherein uh, it comes up with Hadoop in pre-installed on it. So you don't have that extra job. All you have to do is hire machines, establish connections between them, and you can start working on Hadoop. So that is a fully distributed approach. In a pseudo distributed approach, you have one VM, within that different services will be running, which are simulating like different machines. Okay. Now, <clears throat> these kind of packages are also given by organizations like Cloudera, Hortonworks and Mempa. And the good part is all these three are also open source. Okay. All of them are also open source. But then they come up with few limitations and that's why generally uh, it is uh, a, not a very good practice. But then yes, if you can, I'll tell you why it's not a very good practice because uh, in a pseudo distributed vision wherein you can build your own VM with all these Hadoop and its <coughs> components being installed in it and you can start using it. But then when you go to these packages, right? 
you can download it very well from their website but the challenge is the challenge is these organizations give you vm uh, which exclusively need 10 gigs of ram just for booting out your vm so you need to have a very higher end uh, machine so if it, you have very well it's nothing like that you can go ahead and download cloudera based package and you can use it but then if you don't uh, it's not a good option for right so that is where the benefit of pseudo distributed systems comes in wherein it does not need much of uh, a ram now as i said the vm that i do generally provide for my students it need a minimum of 2 gigs ram because we are having only the eco components necessary for us for learning the whole of data engineering part in cloud era along with all these eco components they have their own services running in which demands a higher ram capacity and if you can yes as i said before nothing like that you can go ahead and download and use it because it's at the end of the day it's an open source and along with this we also do get licensed purchases like big insights hd and p water these are also distributed packages which comes with all of the hadoop and the necessary eco components um which are compatible with their own products like when it comes to big insights it's much more compatible with ibm based rdms similarly hd insights p water okay so it is up to you it is open to you so now i have given a wide list of options so it is up to you which one you can choose for your practice fine any questions on the installation part <clears throat> i am not exactly taking the 10 minutes for questions because i managed to answer them i believe uh, in between the session so if you have any questions uh, which was not been addressed before please to put it over in the chat okay fine um fine now let's talk about the background processes or the demons Okay, thanks, Dan, for that. Now, um, these background processes are also known as the demons, which are the essential services for starting out your Hadoop-based services. Now, without these services up and running, I can't run a Hadoop cluster. Now, why? Because again, picture the uh, the cluster on your mind. See, I have this being set up. now the moment i want to communicate with the master and i want to give it some file the master has to be uh, running some algorithm at the back so that it can decide how many blocks it has to split where it has to go and in turn these uh, slave machines will also send the acknowledgement back i should have an algorithm to read all those uh, uh, read all those acknowledgements back right so some kind of program needs to be run at the back end so that the whole of the framework will be up and running now that is where we have this demons what is background processes so now there are four major uh, background processes which we need in version 2 and upward now uh, what are they they are nothing but name node data node resource manager and node manager Uh, these are the norms in version 1 which nobody is using nowadays it, it's kind of an obsolete now it has lot of challenges uh, uh, which sometimes the whole of the cluster itself becomes uh, what say like completely inaccessible so it's a single point of failure version so for that reason nobody is using nowadays in version 2 uh, they have been renamed to resource manager and node manager now these two services right your name node and data node they are responsible for your storage now at the end uh, i say service because that's how it has to be addressed at but if you go deep what they are they are nothing but simple java programs 
which has some set of algorithms defined. In this situation, do this. In this situation, do this. Like that, some instructions for your master will be available as a set of code in the name node service. Similarly, happens with the data node service. Now, these two services, resource manager and node manager, they are responsible for your processing, which is basically your map reduce. Now, among these two, there is one master service, which is called a name node. This service is called, uh, the data node service is basically addressed as slave service. Similarly, here also, resource manager is your master service. Node manager is your slave service. So under my name node, I have some set of instructions which I want the master uh, node to be taken care of. Now, similarly, under your uh, data node as a service, I have some set of instructions which the slave machine has to take care of when it starts working. Now, you can understand it really better by seeing this workflow. Somebody asked about uh, the processing also during that time. If you remember, I told you those questions will be uh, sorted out when you come here and see. So this is a very high level view of workflow. But then if you understand this workflow, most of your questions with respect to the splitting, the block, and all those can be uh, cleared up. Okay. Let me explain it first, and then we'll uh, take questions. Fine. Now I have a file. Okay, and this is my overall cluster. Now I'm approaching my cluster by communicating with my master machine, which is my name. Now, can you see uh, both the master services are together in one machine, right? Similarly, both the slave services are in one machine. Okay, see, uh, instead of job tracker, it can be resource manager also, it can be uh, node manager also. So any idea why do you think both these services I'm writing inside one single machine? Any idea why both the master service are in one single machine? Similarly, why both the slave services are in one single machine? We have seen that, not exactly maybe, but uh, definitely we have covered that part. Anybody wants to answer? Why both the services are in one mission? Or why it should be in one mission? Exactly. Because one is for storage and one is for processing. Yes. Data Simple term is, exactly. That's the straightforward, clear answer. Data look. Then, then only I can prove that the data is locally available to my processing place. I don't have to unnecessarily move forward and backward for consuming my data. If, if my data is happening separately, processing happens separately, then it's going to be ideally a big stuff for me. I need to do a lot of data uh, transfer, wherein just now we have seen about the importance of Hadoop in terms of data locality. And for that reason, I, I put them in a single note. Now, uh, please mute yourself. Okay, fine. Now, coming to the actual flow. I'm giving the file, okay? Now, the moment the file reads, uh, uh, the file has been read by the master, uh, it will apply the formula, which is basically file size divided by the default block size, and it will comes out with a number. Now, I'm um, uh, <coughs> for understanding purpose. <coughs> Give me a second. Yeah. So now, for understanding purpose, I'm considering the file to be split into four blocks, and I'm also calling the replication factor to be replication factor to be three over here. So now can you see the name node has been splitted and they have been stored in different uh, uh, slave machines. I do call them as data node one here. Now similarly, this one is two, this one is three, and this one is four. Now, if you observe the blocks also, you could see every block has been copied three times. 
Correct? All of your blocks have been copied, created. Okay, now everything goes smooth. The split has been happened. The replication factor has been maintained. Now, how the name node will understand basically that the split is proper and the machines are doing good. Every slave machine will basically send a heartbeat signal. And this signal will go for every three seconds. So for every third, third second, all of your slave machines will basically be sending a uh, signal to your name node. And this signal is uh, basically helping the name node to understand that the corresponding data node is doing good. Now, uh, if you are basically from an Unix background, you, can, you could be knowing about this ping command, which is basically to establish connection, like, uh, like a kind of an handshake. You know, the same way here, every individual data node will send a three second ping and the ping is going to tell the name node that things are going normal. As of now, none of the data nodes are down. Everything is smooth and everything is holding their block successfully. And also I'm maintaining the replication factor. So the name node expects in uh, at a frequency of three seconds, it expects signal from all the data nodes uh, to which it has been coupled with. See, let's imagine we have few more also. Okay, don't think that uh, I have only four data nodes here. I have few other data nodes too, but then um, they are not needed to store this particular file. Look, let's call it like this. Okay. Now these guys are also storing some of the data, but not as a part of this file. So that's why I'm not mentioning that. Fine, now things are going smooth, no issues so far. So this is basically called as a happy path scenario, wherein everything goes smooth as expected, no issues so far. Now let's talk about failures because they are unavoidable ones in a Hadoop cluster. Now the first failure is basically any one of the data node goes down. Now I'm just randomly picking one data node and considering that is down. So now let's take DN2 is down. Now the moment DN2 is down for various reasons, right? Uh, it could be uh, uh, some starting from a very simple path failure or, or something got corrupted or a, or a plant maintenance, whatever it could be. For some time, this mission is not accessible. Then the immediate uh, uh, impact would be the name node will not receive an heartbeat signal from this particular data node, right? Now, when it is not receiving an heartbeat signal from a particular data node, that is when the name node decides, okay, DN2 is failed now, and it is not reachable. Now, the moment it is not getting uh, a heartbeat signal from DN2, it understands the blocks inside them, which is B, D, A, are right now under replicated. How? There are only two copies. Right, because overall I need to maintain P and at any point of time in my Hadoop cluster, I have to maintain my replication factor. But right now I'm having only two copies because one of the machine holding my B, D and D is not accessible right now. Then it has become a huge challenge for my name node because it has to fix it, uh, because it has to maintain my replication factor, right? So now how it can be fixed? So that is where name node uh, has some set of algorithm inside it. And what it will do, it will first go and check out, is there any other data node which has enough memory to keep these three blocks together inside it, like BDA inside it. Now, uh, uh, as an example, let's imagine that this machine, let's say D and six, uh, which are right now not having any copy of my file, but they have enough memory to keep this BD. Then the name node will send instructions. Okay, go ahead and take a copy of BDA from uh, other data nodes because all these data nodes are interconnected, right? And take a copy of BDA from the file F and keep it inside. Now things are back to normal. Anyway, DN6 is sending heartbeat signal. So now your name node will also understand, okay, now DN6 is proper. It has been taken a copy of BDA. And right now, three copies has been maintained. 
no more under replication scenario happens things are going smooth right but what if this data node which has gone down for some reason is coming back again and start sending signals because the connection is anyways established so the once the machine comes up it has to again start sending the heartbeat signals right now it starts sending the heartbeat signal now the name node realize okay now dn2 has come up now the biggest challenge when it comes back is it leads to an another situation called over replication in the sense right now the block vda have been maintained four copies now like how i should not be having any under replication the same way i should not be having over replications also right because the job of dn2 is being taken care of dn6 now all of a sudden when dn2 comes in it becomes an extra burden for the name node now how name node tackle this situation because uh, i don't need four copies to be maintained now that is where again it has some set of instructions written which needs to be followed which is called shortest path algorithm now what is this shortest path algorithm will basically do uh, every machine will basically take some uh, some time to be reached right like for example the signal from the name node will take few seconds uh, to reach this data node for example let's take it uh, it takes around some 0.28 seconds okay now similarly from this name node um any signal that has been communicated to dn6 let's take it takes around some 0.32 seconds now what my algorithm is suggesting is go ahead with the node which can be reachable quicker and ask the other node to clear out these new copies which i asked to keep them inside so now in my case dn2 will only be holding dn6 is having a little longer time compared to my dn2 the reachable time and hence the blocks vda in it will basically be asked to be removed so dn6 will purge only the copies b d and a and right now i've been maintaining only three copies of all of the blocks inside my file so this is my second failure scenario which can also be tackled now now the third failure scenario or the last failure scenario that can happen is we discussed about data node failures now i told you about one data node failure the same a uh, scenario happens if two nodes or three nodes uh, goes down now the other failure scenario can be like apart from the name node failure there can also be a failure that can happen on a master machine now this is where the biggest challenge comes now we can't argue saying no the name node will not go down because it's a master remember at the end it is also a commodity machine correct very basic configurations now i cannot argue the fact saying it's a master it can't go down and hence there is a possibility that the name node can also go down now this is where we need the version 2's upper hand so because in version 1 it was a single point of failure in the sense there are no solution for it if the master machine goes down the complete see because a master is a face of your cluster right it's the starting point of your cluster so if he is not available then of course i can't access any of the data inside my cluster so in version 1 it was basically a single point of failure wherein the whole of cluster has to be literally shut down you can't access any of the data so in version 2 because considering this is a critical stuff that has to be addressed they have come forward with a solution called stand by name node now what do we mean by the stand by name node so stand by name node basically is an another node which runs parallel to your name node so let me draw it over here so it's just like an another node 
which is which has to be of the same configuration as of your name mode. So I'm writing it as an SNN, which is basically referred as a standard. And starting from version two, like how all these slay machines are sending that three second heartbeat signal to name mode, these slay machines should also send the heartbeat signals to your SNN as well. But right now, it will be in the passive mode. When your name node is actually working as expected, the SNN will not do any job. It is just in its passive mode. And all the data, the data which my name node is basically holding, that will be available on an another shareable space. So I'm writing here as a shared space. And that will be address or that will be contacted by your SNN as well as you. So your name node will periodically update your shared space and that can be read by your SNN. And these machines are also interconnected. So the moment my name node goes down, immediately SNN gets that idea and it will start behaving as your active name the one which was passive right now will basically start working as an active name node considering the fact that right now name node is not in a reachable state and as you know all your slay machines are sending heartbeat signal to snn so snn is just like your name node just uh, it, it's not its active format other than that all the details that a name node has is also available with your sn just that it is not active because there was an active name node being there and at any point of time, either your name node will be active or your SNN will be active. SNN in the sense, the passive before and the active now, right? So any one of these two master services only has to be active at any given point of time so that there won't be any confusions on to which uh, name node I have to basically do. But this feature is available only starting from version two, uh, which is technically you call it as an um, uh, a name node high availability also. HA is a short term for that. But then at the end, the concept is the name node failure is also uh, uh, can be tackled very well. Okay. Got it. Let me got a few questions. Exactly then what you said is exactly right. Uh, does the heartbeat also update the meta info like available free space? Yes, Subramanian. So the heartbeat is a consolidated message. See, um, uh, it's just like a compressed signal. So if you break them down, the details that it shares are like what is the consumed space on that particular name node? How much is left out? And what are the active blocks which are there inside that particular data node? And these blocks are coming from which file? So basically file F inside which I have ACD and file F2 from that file I have BEF and file F3 from that file I have some PQR. So all these informations will be packed, compressed and send it to the name node in a format of signal. So that is why name node gets an complete up-to-date information of all this link. Uh, where does the shared space reside? So shared space is basically, and um, um, uh, it could be anywhere depending upon the client that you're working with, whatever you feel is the most reliable and a durable one, we do basically keep your uh, name nodes content over there. So uh, this shared space should always be available, right? Because it's a critical component. Now, it has to be always available and it has to be reachable both by your name node and the shared uh, name node. So few clients prefer to have it being located in the on-premise itself with a higher end machine, a higher end configuration machine, making sure that it is highly durable at any point of time. So that is not a generalized statement saying, okay, all your name node, uh, all your shared space will only be stored and so on, so machine. It differs from different clients to clients. It has to be 100%, it has to be replicated, right? If the shared space is not replicated, I know it has it has to be durable at its best, but at the same time, 
uh, I can't always rely on that. So definitely uh, there is a recovery mechanism for your shared space too, if in case it is uh, not reachable. See, checkpoint is an older process, Nani. Checkpoint was in version one when there was a single point of failure concept. So that is where you have your secondary name node. When it's secondary name node manually recovers your metadata. The metadata is nothing but the content inside your shared space, right? And the shared space contents are only FS image edits file. So those are little older concepts. Nowadays, we are not using them, but it was there. In version one, that is how basically you recover your metadata. All your informations, which are there inside your name node, right? What are the information in name node? What do you think will be the actual content of your name node? Okay, you first answer that, then we'll go to the shared space, uh, especially the checkpoint. What do you think will be the content inside your name node? Or what does a name node hold? JSON files, why specifically JSON files? Big. Does NN also send heartbeat to SNN? How SNN? Yes, of course, they will also be sending the heartbeat signal. That is how your SNN will basically understand that this guy is not working. Because after a predefined time, I'm not getting any signals from him. So, certain. Vishnu, to answer your question, yes. SNN and name node will also be sharing information. I'll do that. Let me take questions one by one. So there are a lot of questions coming up. So give me a minute. Let's first come to this. What is the content of a name? Name node, name node, metadata information. Exactly, uh, right? Now for people who are not aware on what is the actual content inside your name node, name node basically contains metadata. Now what is a metadata? It is nothing. <coughs> about the description of your data in the sense. Okay, so now um, F is a file which gets divided into blocks say A, B, C, D, and E. Now the blocks A, B, C are stored in the data node D and 2, uh, uh, and D and E are stored in B and 5, and the replicated copies of A, B, C are stored in let's say D and one and D and three. Now like this for every file that you are keeping inside your Hadoop cluster, the file and the block level information is nothing but the metadata. So it's not the actual data, rather it is going to be the information about your file. Because see, imagine a new client comes and he's asking for a file, then how the name node will understand from where I have to fetch it only by referring the metadata. So, so generally they do say like the metadata is basically like a TOC of a book, like the table of contents, right? Um, or like an index. So if I want to go to a particular topic on a, let's say on a thousand page book, it's very hard for me to go if there are no indexes, right? So what I'll do, I'll go to the front of the book where I have the table of content, search for that keyword. If I find that keyword in any of the topic, then I directly go to the page number and extract the same way. So when a client comes and approach name node, a name node should not worry like, okay, from, from a set of thousand nodes, where can I find my file? Then that is where it refers a metadata. It, can, it gets the immediate data, go to the corresponding data nodes, extract it, share it with your client. So the details of a name node is nothing but a metadata. And this metadata will only be stored on your shareable space, which can be anywhere, but most preferably choose by your clients. And that shared space will also have a recovery mechanism. It has replication factor in them by itself so that uh, I can neglect all those risks of losing my metadata. Uh, Sylvia, could you repeat what is SNN? SNN stands for standby name node. And standby name node is going to be a passive name node, which has the same configuration of your name node. So now uh, why it needs to be maintaining the same configuration is because at any point of time, if I feel my name node is lost or name node is not accessible, then SNN should automatically pitch us in uh, 
and it should start behaving as an active name node. And hence, the configuration, the content of your name node, the signals that a name node receive, everything should be exactly sent to my SNN also. So it's just like a backup. To be very simple, SNN are nothing like a backup of your name node. So if you want something to be backup, I have to give all the details to the backup too, right? Got that? So SNN is nothing but standby name node. Secondary name node, as I said, it's a little older concept wherein uh, during that time of version one, when SNN was not introduced, your standby name node was not introduced. Uh, we do have an another node called secondary name node, but that's not an passive name node. Uh, it does a job at the back, which helps you to recalculate the metadata by using FS image and edit spec. Let's not go into that because we are not using that anymore. We are having a high availability feature of SNN uh, by which you can handle the failure of a name. Got it? Uh, am I clear then? Then yes. And am I clear to Vishnu? Shubramanya, is that clear? And not. Okay, then said yes. How about others? Okay, Vishnu says yes. Any other question? Any, any other questions from the overall workflow? Okay. Shubramanya, for you, is that clear? The shared space concept. And also about where it has to be. As I said, there's no generalized place uh, that you can refer. Network file share is one of the common uh, default approach that most of the clients do follow, but then you can't uh, go by the default one because it, it's a, like a very uh, important information and hence most of the time it will be stored in an on-premise, but at the end it has to be chosen only by your business. Okay. Fine, any other question guys? Not from this page, from the overall on whatever we have covered so far. Okay, I'll do two, we are using yarn. Yes, exactly, yarn. We'll be covering that. We'll not be able to cover them completely on a webinar like this, but then the complete yarn structure and how the architecture goes, all of them will be covered on the class. I can give you a uh, heads up towards that uh, in the tomorrow session wherein we will be studying about MapReduce and we'll also see um, uh, how I can uh, basically uh, extract data from a component through scoop and also how I can extract files. So tomorrow we'll be seeing about how to bring in files of different structure like a JSON or an Avro or a CSV file, how you can bring them inside your VM. And also if it is from an RDBMS, say MySQL, how you can bring those uh, MySQL tables inside your uh, HDFS on your VM. And after you bring in, how we are going to process them by writing some simple Hive queries. So I will be showing them also uh, in your uh, tomorrow session on the VM. 